Limbo, like its spiritual sequel Inside, is a game that doesn't ever really let you go. A visual and atmospheric experience like no other, Limbo has captured imaginations across the world, becoming a cult classic along the way. Despite its release way back in 2010, there is still discussion today about the meaning of Limbo. And given the dedication that any hardcore gaming fanbase has to its games, the fact that Limbo still lacks an acceptable narrative canon over a decade later is kind of insane. It might seem odd that an indie game less than a couple of hours long can evade our understanding for such a long time, and that every time a solution is put forward it emits more odd details than it includes. This being said, Ongoing discussion and interpretation is par for the course with literature and cinema, so why should it not be the same with games? Part of the reason that we don't think like this about games is that there is still a general feeling that gaming as a medium is a bit basic and for kids. And it's not difficult to see why. The unfairly lowly status of gaming as a medium affects the way in which we discuss gaming content and affects our expectations of what is being provided. Most of the discussion surrounding Limbo is rather basic and literal, because that is what the audience expects from the medium. But Limbo isn't an ordinary game. It's a game drawing enormous aesthetic influence from 1920s German Expressionist cinema. Like the silent movies of that era, it's a game that attempts to tell a story without words. Most would say it's a game about the souls of at least one but potentially two dead children, lost and alone on the edge of hell, and it tries to tell that story while abandoning a conventional plot. Like Inside, it's a game with a strong ethical message that forces the player at several points to ask, what have I done? It also asks them to examine their differing attitudes towards the horrors committed by others and those committed by ourselves, and it's packed full of symbolism. I don't think I'll be the only one who holds the two apparently conflicting beliefs that A. Limbo makes absolutely zero sense, but also B. I kind of feel like I understand it in some odd, inarticulable way. That is because, when it comes to games, our instincts are to try and make sense of the plot in order to follow the narrative. But with Limbo, this is a mistake. Limbo has lots of interesting facets, but plot is one thing that it doesn't have. Just like with Inside, instead of asking, what's going on, you're far better off asking, what is this game trying to say? If you try to make sense of the story by following the plot in Limbo, you're going to tie yourself in knots. Because a bearless forest full of bear traps, being stalked through the woods by an impossibly giant spider, fleeing from some murderous boys armed with punji pits, flaming tyres, blowpipes and heavy squish pistons, an odd hamster frog operated machine that somehow controls the weather, the slowly rising insta-kill water, parasitic mind worms that don't light the light, a flooded abandoned town, an enormous mosquito, electrified floors and hotel signage, motion sensitive machine guns, circular saws and obscure gravity altering machines have exactly zero thematic ties to one another. I counted. You're going to get absolutely nowhere trying to pack all that into a cohesive plot and you'll spend all your time trying to account for one weird detail only to find that it only fits with your theory if you conveniently forget about another. It's a long and maddening process. And yet this is the approach that most people take, despite the fact that it never gets as any closer to solving the riddle of its meaning, as well as each new take very clearly not making any cohesive sense without major leaps of faith and overuse of the words maybe, suppose, what if, and perhaps. This approach has led to a fairly narrow spectrum of interpretations of Limbo taking precedence over others. Limbo was originally marketed under the slogan, unsure of his sister's fate, a boy enters Limbo. So it's generally accepted that the boy himself is dead. But there are those who argue 
that so is his sister, and that they died either having fell from the treehouse or else in a car crash, and now the boy must find his sister in order to leave Limbo and pass on. The car crash theory tries to make sense of the gravity section by claiming it's emblematic of the boy's final moments as his car rolled and he was sent careering through the windscreen. The recurring imagery of tyres throughout the game is also used as supporting evidence. It might be argued that the title alone is enough to confirm the boy being dead, Purgatorial Limbo of course being the place next door to hell that souls enter when they aren't fit to enter heaven and don't deserve to enter hell itself, and the terrifying environment in which we find ourselves would seem to support this. But Limbo has another meaning outside of theology, describing the state of anxious worry that comes from not knowing something you need to know. If a boy was uncertain of his sister's fate, then he certainly would be in Limbo. So I feel that the suggestion that these children are dead is questionable, and that they died falling from a tree, or even more bizarrely in a car crash, is in my view nothing but conjecture, clutching at straws. Different theories posit that the disparate settings of the game represent places that the boy visited during his life. A rather dull reading of the game, again based on guesswork grounded in little to no evidence. Other theories get slightly closer to the mark, with the suggestion that the game's events are representative of the boy's fears during his life. He's scared of spiders, he couldn't swim, he once got electrocuted, etc, etc. Another common cop-out, I mean take, is that Limbo is deliberately ambiguous and you can interpret it any way you like, with one person's interpretation as good as the next. And finally, there are those that don't like thinking because it make brain hurt, who claim that Limbo has no meaning whatsoever and is simply pretentious. Oh, no, 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 stop getting Bond wrong. Unfortunately, every single one of these theories stems from an attempt to decode the plot. Which is why, in my view, no one has as of yet delivered a satisfactory explanation of the meaning of the story. In short, you're doing it wrong. So how are we supposed to understand Limbo when it contains environments and a plot that refuse to make sense? How are we supposed to reconcile its many paradoxes and self-contradictions into a meaningful story or piece of work? Well, let's start with what we can know about it. The most immediately striking thing about Limbo is its visual style. The black and white presentation of Limbo's abstract and stylized environments, as well as its heavy reliance on light and shadows to create atmosphere, tell us that the major aesthetic influence for Limbo is the German Expressionist cinema of the 1920s and 30s. If you still need convincing of this, you can even see the faint flickering at the edges of the screen as though we're watching the game play out on an old projector. For people like F.W. Murnau and Robert Veen, who are credited as major practitioners of Expressionist cinema, responsible for films like Nosferatu and The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, this aesthetic framework was a creative development born out of the director's desire to show the audience the subconscious feelings of the on-screen characters, coupled with the technological and budgetary constraints that came with the challenge of making movies in the 1920s. The films had to be silent and too much in the way of written dialogue cards would be disruptive to the flow of the movie. As a result, directors often use surreal set designs in order to portray a character's psychological or emotional state externally in the environment. The audience is not shown what is real, but rather an abstracted version of what the characters believe to be real. In this way, the subconscious feelings of the characters become the subject of the work not only through the characters themselves, but by the environment in which they are placed. Most notably in the cabinet of Dr Caligari, the abstract and warped set designs are magnificently weird and unsettling. As well as providing the audience with a subconscious reason to suspect that something is not quite right and to therefore be apprehensive about what is to come, the heavily stylized sets act as a canvas onto which the mental states of the characters can be painted. In my notes when watching this film, to research the video, 
I scribbled down that the set designs were insane. And, well, let's just say that this bold stylistic choice isn't just for the sake of it. So when Limbo begins its story in a forest, it's just too simplistic to say that the boy is literally in a forest, or that it is a forest that the boy remembers. In expressionist works, it's more accurate to start from the assumption that the boy is the forest, meaning to say that the forest is a physical manifestation of what the boy is going through emotionally and psychologically. In this way, we can account for the disparate and disconnected environments in the game, as well as the odd recurring imagery. Expressionist cinema was extremely influential and its success was arguably only halted by the emergence of National Socialism in Germany in the 1930s and the subsequent onset of war. Before its journey was curtailed by these nightmarish events, Expressionist cinema helped to establish the notion that cinema could be more than just entertainment, it could be art. Limbo is often credited with sparking a similar conversation within the medium of video games. Where the bulk of the money in the gaming industry ends up in the hands of major developers that pump out reskinned versions of the same game every year for £90 a pop, studios like Playdead are pushing the boundaries of what can be achieved in games, redrawing the lines of what a game is supposed to be, of what a game can be. That Limbo draws heavily from the creative school of expressionist cinema is a strong indication that this influence does not end with the aesthetic. While certainly Playdead will have had major budgetary constraints when creating Limbo, the technological constraints are not comparable to those faced by directors of 1920s cinema. To mimic this style is therefore a conscious and deliberate choice, and one likely to have been made with a view to achieving the same narrative goals in similar ways. Playdead were obviously aware of the creative opportunities that such a stylistic direction afforded them. I think therefore that it is a fair assumption that the homage to 1920s expressionism and film noir goes far deeper than simply the aesthetic. As I noted in Battle Not With Monsters, my analysis of Inside, the first playthrough is always important in decoding a Playdead game because so much of the meaning is tied up in how the game makes you feel when you play it. What is going on? The pervasive sense of dread and fear that comes with a first playthrough of Limbo, stemming from the nightmarish, shadowy imagery and the gruesome, grisly demises that the boy will repeatedly experience as you slowly learn how to traverse the environment, is one of the major ways in which the developers are trying to communicate with you. And this, for me, is why Playdead was so great. The player is part of the game, whether they like it or not. One of the biggest ways that Limbo communicates with the player is through its environments. Even though these disparate settings don't make any structural or contiguous sense, we can definitively say that Limbo's environment is hostile. This was noted in Miguel Penabella's excellent 2021 article for Haywire magazine. For Penabella, the stylized use of hostile environments and shadowy lighting ground the psychological elements of the game while serving as a pretense for the physical manifestation of loss and trauma. Penabella notes that communicating through dangerous environments has a real-world precedent, recalling the field of study known as nuclear semiotics, which tries to figure out how best to warn future generations to stay away from nuclear waste disposal sites. You can't rely on anybody understanding any language we use today, so communicating danger has to be done in other ways, like making the environment terrifying on an almost Lovecraftian scale by covering it in giant metal spikes or hellish fields of thorns, in the hope that people will think twice about walking through. Limbo does this too, using the hostile environment to communicate to players that the world we find ourselves in is one of violence, in which you will never be safe. It's perhaps worth pointing out that while the environment itself is hostile, so are we, 
and yet it never even occurs to us that we might be one of the monsters here too. The hostile environment is also discussed in Patricia Hernandez's wonderful 2010 essay which noted the etymological link between toil, suffering and the idea of travel, framing limbo as a journey through hell. Hernandez notes that once we leave our civilised, homely environments behind and walk out into the woods, we become acutely aware of the delicacy of human skin. For Hernandez, limbo taps into these deep-rooted issues. The first thing to happen is the boy wakes up to find himself in the middle of a forest. Without knowing anything about the game at all, we already associate the setting with hostility. We've got no choice but to move forward, and in this case, through hell. She also notes the link between the word walk and awake, going on to reference the Aboriginal Australian belief that they and the world are one thing inextricably connected. To exist is to acknowledge the environment in which you find yourself and therefore the process of walking through a landscape is the same as learning about yourself. I find it curious that this, just as with German Expressionism, deals chiefly with the concept that the individual and the environment in which it finds itself are one and the same, that the one blends into the other. Hernandez further elaborates that this notion is tied to the idea of singing the land into existence. In an original culture, the land and those who dwell within it are connected in a web of song lines which mark roots across the land or sky. Through knowledge of a song line, a person is able to navigate across the land by repeating the words of the song, which describe the location of landmarks, of sources of water and other natural phenomena. In Limbo, the boy must navigate the landscape in a similar way. The ways in which death is waiting for the boy aren't always clear, so he must learn by trial and error when to make the right moves, jumps and decisions, the right notes to sing and the song line of this landscape. The point about song lines is particularly notable given Limbo's award-winning soundtrack, sparse and ambient, weaving seamlessly into and out of the sounds of the forest, of the howling wind and the rhythmic, rumbling clunk of giant turning cogs. The idea is further bolstered by the infamous dark route, which must be navigated entirely by sound for long sections. But if you know the song line, you'll be fine. It's not difficult to see the links between this school of thought and the principles of German Expressionist cinema. Namely the interconnected blending of psyche and environment that underpin the abstract narrative that Limbo wants to communicate. And I remind you that if we are to read Limbo through the lens of its expressionist influences, then the game's hostile environments represent the boy's internal trauma. The various traps and dangers, therefore, serve as psychological defence mechanisms preventing him from reaching clarity. The key point for me is the nature of the trauma in question. For most people, the final moments of the game confirm that a horrendous accident has taken place and that the boy needed to return to this pivotal moment of trauma to gain closure. It is assumed almost without question that the boy is already dead. Is he though? Not necessarily. I said earlier that the assumption that the boy is dead and going through purgatorial limbo on the edge of hell is more or less taken for granted. But there's a problem here, and it's that purgatorial limbo is not a thing. In Christian mysticism there is purgatory and there is limbo, and while often the two are conflated, this is a misreading and they are not even slightly the same thing. Purgatory is the place that the baptised Christians go to expunge themselves of their sins before they can enter heaven. It's not a nice place, and purging your soul of sin isn't by any means a fun process, but it isn't the hellish ordeal that the boy experiences in this game. Limbo, on the other hand, is where the righteous but unbaptised souls go after death. Being unbaptised, they're not Christian, so they can't enter heaven, but seeing as they were nice people, they go to the nicest bit of hell, on the very edge. With each circle of hell, the punishments and tortures that its denizens receive, for all eternity, get worse and worse the further in you go. 
In Limbo, the punishment is to be struck with grief from a lack of God's presence. Now, don't get me wrong, being struck with grief forever is not my idea of a holiday, but it certainly isn't consistent with the limbo we see represented in the game. There are no giant spiders, no machine guns, no circular saws. Just sadness. I mean, it is forever, so it's still fairly awful, but if it's a choice between that and the fate that awaits heretics, who will be sent to the city of Dees in the sixth circle and locked in burning stone coffins for all eternity, I'm getting in the queue for eternal grief every single time. It's possible that the boy is indeed dead, and it's possible that Playdead were playing with the common misconception of what Limbo is. It's even possible that they made a mistake in the theological interpretation. If we want to ignore this inaccuracy, then we can make a case that Limbo is the experience of the boy reckoning with the evils he committed in his life. He was fond of pulling the legs off spiders and flies. He was a bully in a gang responsible for injuring or maybe even killing another kid. Maybe even. But seeing as neither theological purgatory or limbo are remotely comparable to the game's events, the dead boy in purgatorial limbo theory seems unlikely to me. Further, it isn't just theologically erroneous, it also makes a mess of the game's thematics. Limbo the game is about fear, not sadness. It is for that reason that I reject this theory. To accept it would be giving ourselves another inconsistency to try and explain away, when we can make a case for a working, consistent theory of Limbo without it. By discounting it, we also lose the need for the boy to be dead, so another interpretation of what the title references is required. Most likely, the state of anxiety stemming from a lack of closure. This, of course, fits the brief, because as we know from the original marketing, the boy does not know what has become of his sister, and is therefore worried about her. Given what we know about expressionist cinema, we can confidently allege that the aggressively hostile environment in which he finds himself lost is, to a greater or lesser degree, a manifestation of himself. Add to this what we all know about Limbo as the experience of worrying about those we love, and the catastrophizing that comes with traumatic anxiety, and we have the beginnings of an understanding of what Limbo is all about. If we are to read the game in this way, then this is a story about a boy who, having lost his sister, is stricken with worry about what might have happened to her. His worries start off as fairly basic and primal. Perhaps she got drowned, or got caught in a bear trap. What if she was flattened by a loose boulder? Maybe she fell from a tree or tumbled down a hill crashing onto the sharp rocks below. Reasonable fears grounded in reality. But when he is unable to find her, his imagination gets the better of him and he starts to worry about worse things, abstract things, irrational things. Anybody who's walked alone through a forest at night will tell you that your mind can conjure up really crazy imaginary threats that just wouldn't happen in the same forest in daylight. Perhaps a tribe of feral boys have murdered her. Perhaps she was bitten by a giant spider and is now caught in its web. Maybe a strange machine caused a biblical flood and she was unable to escape the rising waters. Maybe she made it to the city, found a hotel in which to stay, but then got electrocuted. Maybe she's okay actually, and is still by the treehouse. No, don't be silly. She has to be hurt or we would have found her already. She'll probably have wandered into the industrial area and been ground up by a giant cogwheel, or crushed in the machinery, or been mistaken for a trespasser and gunned down. His mind spins with the endless possibilities of what might have become of her, faster and faster until he no longer knows which way is up, and at length the absurdity of his position is too much and he snaps out of it, waking once again into the forest and turning the opposite direction. There she is, finally, alive and well, by the treehouse where we left her. And this is the point where the boy's anxiety ends, his state of limbo ends, and therefore the game ends too.